Episode three begins in the space above Coruscant with the big space battle. All the space battles that had happened in the previous pictures were literally out in space. And what we were saying here was that this battle was still in the upper atmosphere. We weren't quite into space yet. And that gave us a license to do atmospherics. We could do smoke trails and flame. We could have hanging smoke and debris from uh, damaged ships. And we could have drag on missiles. It's just a bit of a different look from how space battles had been treated previously. Come on, R2, fight them off. Get them off this jet. Fighter thing. <laughs> One thing I thought was amusing about the Jedi Starfighter set that we had was that for the angles where we're looking at our characters front on, um, we shot through the front window of it. And um, when we were first setting those up, George didn't like uh, the knees of the characters being right in front of the lens. And that was really the best access point was through that front window. So um, we had the actors drop their, their knees down, but once you drop your knees down, your legs aren't bent anymore, and the only place for your feet to go is outside the, the front windows. So all those scenes where you see the characters uh, piloting the, the craft, their feet are sticking out of the windows on the, on the front. Now, break right! Left. <laughs> Ready? Let's do that again. Some new Coruscant locations on episode three included the Opera House, uh, where Anakin has a private discussion with Palpatine. There's some cameos in that. I think uh, George and his, his daughter are, are uh, just outside the opera box. One of the things that's, that's kind of fun about working on these, these pictures where uh, the whole worlds have to be created is those, those worlds have to be populated. How, who do you get to populate the, these worlds? You get the cheapest labor you can, which is uh, ourselves. So Roger Gayat and uh, Rob Coleman and I and Denise Ream, Jill Brooks and Janet Lewin are all um, in an opera box that's the next one over. So it was all the producers and supervisors box. I'm also, uh, I'm Anakin's hand a couple of times. When Anakin is sliding down the, the elevator shaft and there's a close shot of his hand catching the cables, that's actually my hand. There's a tight view of Anakin sort of twisting his lightsaber and, uh, and cutting off Count Dooku's hands and that's me as, uh, as Anakin. <laughs> One of the things that, that George likes to, to do, because I've seen him do it a number of times, is, um, is if there's some portion of a set that we've seen in a previous picture that uh, was left um, unbuilt or was uh, unseen in the picture, that, that's an opportunity to, to do something with it. In episode two, we had Palpatine's big round red office, and it was 270 degree set. So there was a 90 degree section that was left unbuilt for camera access. We built that missing section on episode three, and that's where the hallway that goes down to Palpatine's private secret office are. Similarly, Padme's apartment had been seen previously in episode two, but there were a couple areas that, that hadn't been established before. In a corridor that, that leads off of Padme's bedroom, there's a staircase that goes down to her veranda. It's a new part of the set that we hadn't seen previously. Another new area for Coruscant is the Imperial Rehabilitation Center. This is this emergency medical area that Anakin has taken with after he's so horribly injured on Mustafar. This is where he becomes Darth Vader. Awaken him. This was a very small partial set. We had just the floor and the table that he was on. The rest of it is a virtual digital environment. Astute viewers will notice that, that Yoda changes a little bit between episode two and three. Uh, between episode two and three, subsurface scattering had been developed, and you can see it in the translucency in his ears. I tried to make sure they still kind of looked like the same Yoda, but he was just a little bit better in episode three. Yoda has a lot of performance to do. He has a broad range of emotions he has to, to, uh, to portray. And he has to do a lot of action. He has a very lengthy, involved fight with Palpatine in the Senate chamber and, uh, and in the office below. The fight scene in the Senate chamber was, uh, was a fun one to do, since uh, we had seen the, the Senate chamber in the previous pictures as this important place for, for uh, public discussion and policy setting, suddenly being used as the background for a big battle where they're throwing the pods around and they're smashing into each other using them as weapons. It was uh, nice graphically and a, and a nice uh, dramatic statement. I think by the time we got to episode three, we were pretty practiced at doing Coruscant, so th that was one of the, the more straightforward environments we had to deal with.
Another happy landing. I just kind of asked George one day if I could have a different color lightsaber. Good guys are green and blue, bad guys are red. That's just the way it works. No purple left? You, you might get purple. Then when I came back for some reason, we were ready to do something. He said, oh, I got something to show you. And he showed it to me. And he said, oh, it's just an experiment right now. I don't know if we're going to keep it. And it was there. But somehow, or other, even though he had done it as an experiment, it was already on the website. And, you know, he let me keep it. And then Nick Gaylord graciously has been trying to figure out a really spectacular and kind of wonderful saber battle for me to do. And he's combined a lot of different styles of things um, so that it looks very good and it travels very well and it's pretty spectacular. And it, it actually makes me dominant. It makes me vulnerable. It, it kind of makes me sneaky in ways. It makes me strong. It shows a lot of different kinds of sides of mace in the middle of this fight. It's, it's almost like I've practiced for this death all my life. Uh, mainly because I've been doing this death scene all my life in various forms because I've always wanted to be this kind of Errol Flynn like swashbuckler and I did it with all my friends from you know the time I was like two or three years old we had sticks and we sword fought through trees and off our porches and down hills and on our bicycles and everywhere else and all of a sudden I'm battling my way through three and four rooms and it's kind of like finally you know so I'm pleased with the drama of it all and the fact that it's clear that I'm standing there and I'm winning this battle actually even without Anakin's help up until he steps in and does what he does to turn the tide and that you know I go out the way I do. I've been begging not to die in my sleep or get stabbed in the back by, you know, some clone. And it didn't happen. So I'm happy. In episode three, Budapest's location of General Grievous's uh, command base. This is a planet where there are these large sinkholes and the cities are built on the inside walls of the sinkholes. Our thought about that was that, that, uh, that the air pressure isn't uh, sufficient uh, up at the surface. It's not down until you're in the, the holes that, uh, that there's enough uh, air for comfortable breathing. Utapau had very little in the way of actual practical sets. There was a landing platform set that we repurposed to be where Obi-Wan lands originally. It's also Grievous's secret platform. Everything else was a combination of miniatures and map paintings and computer graphics. The sinkhole itself was built at two different scales. We had a sinkhole that was about six feet in diameter and about 12 feet high that was a big foam sculpted miniature for the widest views of the city. And then we had a close-up section that just represents a small arc of one wall with a lot of buildings that could be reconfigured in different ways to appear to be different parts of the city. We had one Jedi Starfighter full-size set piece that had been built. That Starfighter needed to appear uh, both in front of a blue screen and a green screen in different scenes. and. It had to appear uh, with different colored markings on it. To avoid uh, blue markings in front of a blue screen or green markings in front of a green screen, we ended up with it painted a slightly violet color so that we didn't have a color blending problem. And the idea was then we would take the, the, the color of the panels and shift them back to uh, do a hue change on them to get them back to the blue that they were meant to be. The one Utapau character that we see and talk to is uh, Bruce Spence. Greetings, young Jedi. What brings you to our remote sanctuary? Who was in Road Warrior. He was the, the uh, uh, gyro captain in Road Warrior. I just really liked that picture, and it was fun to have that actor 
there in the Star Wars pictures. Not unlike the Geonosis Arena in Episode 2, one of the big challenges dealing with Utapau was how many shots these backgrounds were visible in. Not wanting to, to be in the same situation where we had um, one asset that had to be photographed by multiple crews to get all the, the different pieces. We elected to take the model that had been built and we photographed it for a handful of hero shots where we got a really good look at it. But then for the dozens and dozens of shots where we needed to just have that in the background, we laser scanned the model. Um, we used that to generate a, a CG surface. Um, we took photography of the model uh, and then projected that onto that surface. That allowed us to then create unique views of the city for dozens and dozens of backgrounds so that those backgrounds could be created in parallel by many different artists. <laughs> General Grievous's command center on Utapau is the central ball of one of the big Nemoidian battleships. It's called Level 10. There's a huge fight in here between Grievous and, and it's a big fight. And then, and then Grievous takes off. Grievous gets on this big wheel motorcycle. Obi-Wan pursues him on the Boga Lizard. Having a, a human being riding a CG creature is, uh, is a challenging thing. Not so much for the close shots, because you know in the close shots you can be entirely on the live action and you don't see the, the split. You might just see a tail moving in the background or a head in the foreground. But where they're not connected, those shots are easier to deal with. And then the, the very wide shots, um, it's a computer-generated figure on a computer-generated character, so those are fairly easy to, to, to deal with. It's the, the mid-ground shots where we were close enough that we needed to shoot Ewan to be the, the character, but it had to go on the computer-generated lizard. And really getting the motion to match uh, between the two, that's really the hard part. A successful strategy on the previous pictures had been that the elements that really needed to be in contact, where his legs actually are, are on the saddle, um, those would be computer-generated. So for the most part, Obi-Wan's actually split at the waist on a lot of those shots. Towards the end of episode two, George would hint about the existence of the lava planet, which I had heard about when I was a kid, but always knew that we'd be ending up on this lava world. Of course, that's where the biggest, baddest lightsaber fight of the entire six movies takes place, when Obi-Wan has to fight Anakin, finally. The savagery and crazed, you know, extravagance of the environment kind of equals the storytelling about what's going on at that point. It's over, Anakin! I have the high ground! The process started with taking a walk around the ranch, daydreaming and saying, oh my gosh, we're here, you know, taking a trip over to the archives and just getting inspired to follow the Joe Johnsons and the Ralph McQuarrie's of the world. Kind of above the Golden Gate Bridge, in that type of rock, mm -hmm. I took photos of the sort of twisted shale, sedimentary rock, mm -hmm. might, be, might get some ideas. The Mustafar stuff was approached the same way we approached all the stuff on Star Wars, where we would read a little bit of the script before George actually came up and talked to us about it. We'd have a bunch of ideas kind of floating around our head, and he liked to just let us kind of go for it a little bit. So he would say something very obscure and very minimal, like lava planet. What does the planet do? We figured out what Mustafar is. That's the jumping up point. Okay, is this a technological lava planet and they're controlling the lava, or is it a complete wild, primordial kind of a place? And ultimately ended up being kind of a blend of those two things, but we explored each kind of uh, extreme. This lava could all be liquid gold, liquid obsidian, liquid unobtainium, whatever. It's a Star Wars movie. We wanted to kind of take all that inspiration, turn on its side a little, not go right for every volcanic reference. I kind of look from other ways around, like dams, hydroelectricity. There's a lot of mega structure engineering with very heavy, it couldn't even be concrete, but steel or some kind of unknown material that's built by a very technologically savvy world to control the lava. It's built on a volcano and they're using the energy of the volcano oh, or, the, okay. or the minerals of the volcano or something like that to do whatever they're doing okay. there. Early on, we were specifically told by George, do not filter anything because you think it'd be too hard to do. <laughs> we were really told flat out to press up against what was technologically achievable. 
that's starting to look good. That, this is good. Not quite sure about that. That may be too much. He did want clear and iconic shapes. Everything had to read as very distinct. This gets into the toast factor, but it's a good toast factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and I don't GTA. We'll kind of figure that one out. The CG guys were doing fluid dynamic simulations of lava very early on, and that inspired us to keep going even further with potential scenarios for the fight. This is a 134th scale environment of Mustafar, and we're getting ready to run our lava test. Everything is looking really good. The largest model physically on episode three is definitely Mustafar. The size is somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 feet deep and 30 feet wide with a, a 30 foot uh, lava flow somewhere in the neighborhood of four feet wide. As the sequence evolves and we end up going further and further down the river towards the waterfall, those are all different miniatures that we use to accomplish that sort of pathway. Do you want to be made out of shock or something? Yeah. <laughs> We also referred to real footage of lava and began to replicate the look of real crust. This waterfall is flowing incredibly well. The lava is made up of a number of different products. One of them is this product called methacyl, and it's dyed orange. So when it flows, it looks like lava. When you see them fighting, doing their thing, underneath it all, there's a physical model and lava and everything. But on top of that, you have all this other stuff that just adds a kind of scale to it. We shot in multiple passes so that when they composite it, they can use different elements and so they could enhance the light or they could make the lava brighter and all these different things. So it gives you a bit more control. We've got elements of lava flying up in the air, smoke pouring through, there's ash blowing around, you know, there's cameras shaking. So when you watch the movie, you've got some kind of visceral reaction to it. God, that looks hot. What I'm most proud of is it reads immediately as Star Wars, and it held up to that uh, expectation I had for 20 years or so. I am becoming more powerful than any Jedi has ever dreamed of, and I'm doing it for you. Hayden's character is obviously the one that's really going through the change and mine is much more just reactive to that. Padme has a pretty centered self that it's not that she goes through this big change internally but that external things are changing around her and she has to sort of um, make decisions to, to cope with that. If she had some different concept of um, you know government or what's right or morality you know she she might have been able to to stay with him, you know, if her loyalties to him were, you know, just sort of above everything. But Padme is a politician. She's been a leader of, of many people. Naboo's system has been invaded by the droid army. This is sort of combining being a woman with being a politician, which is an interesting combination we don't see much of. I think the role is really sort of what the true meaning of feminism in my in my sort of interpretation of it. Look, whatever happens out there, follow my lead. I'm not interested in getting into a war here. As a member of the Senate, maybe I can find a diplomatic solution to this mess. I think the true feminism is bringing what is particular to women, because we are different, that's undeniable, <laughs> um, to, to the opportunities that men have. So it's not, you know, going into some place and just behaving like a man or necessarily desiring what men want just because you can get it. And together you and I can rule the galaxy. And so rather than being consumed with the thirst for power as many of the the people around her do, um, both men and women, um, she she stays true to, to her compassion and her um, belief in democracy and humanity. If this body is not capable of action, I suggest new leadership is needed. The opening crawl says it, you know, war. We had known all through working on episode two that episode three was gonna be about the Clone Wars, it's gonna be a war movie. The first week starting episode three was George wanted to see 
10 planets for the war to be happening on. That's all he said, is like, the war is happening, give me 10 planets. And following George's rules, they have to be completely distinct from one another within distinct architectural style, distinct color scheme, distinctly different places. So Kashyyyk was great to, uh, to have a crack at. We immediately went back and watched the Star Wars Christmas special, which features Kashyyyk heavily. And we actually were inspired by a lot of the stuff that Ralph McQuarrie had done for that. A lot of the, that, that was, that served as a direct inspiration actually for the way we took Kashyyyk. Originally Kashyyyk was basically Bora Bora with giant thousand foot tall cantilevered trees. I mean, very colorful, very bright, vivid, the way the South Pacific is. Towards the end, George took that color out to kind of sell the wartime, kind of somber aspect of it. But we always saw it as a, it's very Polynesian, very, you know, very beautiful place. The Kashyyyk environment has involved a miniature beach set, which was, I think it was eighth scale. So it's kind of G.I. Joe size. And then we also had the tree, which was done at a different scale, but the tree, which is where all the Wookiees hang out and do their thing. And that was a big model. It was about 12 feet high as a physical model. And it had some detachable branches and stuff so that we could reorganize it. So we could use one tree and shoot it multiple times and reorientate it so it appeared like there were more than one tree. So when you see the movie, you'll see sometimes four or five trees on the beach or something. Most of the time, it's actually one tree that's just been sort of reorganized. It's a very different environment. And the great thing about Star Wars is you travel to all these other worlds and places. And when you see Kashyyyk, it's got a certain tone to it. And with these giant trees and the water and the lagoon and the mountains and everything. And then all of a sudden this battle breaks out. So it's kind of a saving private Ryan of Wookiee land, you know. The other Clone War worlds we had, um, there was Utapau, of course, and then there were other, kind of. What ended up as Maegito started out as an illustration of a glowing lightsaber Jedi hiding behind the hulk of a, a machine with a giant looming battle droid behind. I kept wanting to get um, grit and atmosphere, inspired by all the great war movies that we have, and there's certain colors and certain feels of different kind of war. So Maegito actually started out as kind of a Europe Battle of the Bulge kind of a thing, in that it's snowing, ashes falling, that kind of a thing. It ended up being set on the crystal planet, but that same basic giant battle droids looming in ash versus these Jedi, that carries through till the end. Felucia was another thing. Vietnam, obviously, beautiful jungle, right? The most beautiful rainforest is where this horrible apocalypse is taking uh, place on. So Felucia started out with just one image of completely alien plants, kind of gummy bear material, but translucent, very kind of amphibian or fungal with a giant scale. We have what started out as Bridge World, which is what we always call it, which uh, was originally Seleucami and then got renamed as Cato Nemoidia, which you see for a very brief second. We originally, we would, were going to go back in and see where the Nemoidians kind of lived in these opulent, literally gold walled and velvet red floored, you know, very kind of take off on a 15th century French, very extravagant architecture. And so we designed Cato Nemoidia to reflect their kind of complete greed and, and you know, even they had, they had walking around butler bots bringing wine to them and, and stuff like that, but everything's gold encrusted and stuff. George worked very closely with the, um, the animatics guys who would model and texture and light in an entire set in a few hours. I would say eight to 10 other planets that never get shown in the movie and, and were cut out. We also had Steven Spielberg working on his version of some of these sequences. So Steven wanted to play with not showing the death. For instance, when Ayla Secure is killed on Felucia, we see the camera boom up past uh, these kind of pitcher plants. The camera's obscured by those, but we see the kind of what's going on by the implied explosions going on behind it. He had other ideas for how on Cato Nemoidia, there was an aerial dogfight going on, but it was taking place in between giant columns of smoke where you, it's really hide and seek where you're seeing this very visual storytelling about this realization that this really bad thing is happening as the Jedi are being murdered throughout the galaxy all at one time. I didn't know at the time how rapidly that montage was gonna go. We took, you know, a year's work and boiled it down into probably under three minutes of, of that montage. And in the end, the Clone War worlds that we 
came up with for these to happen on had to be, you know, distinct and interesting, but, you know, step out of the way for George to tell his story. Ah! Ah! 